maybe the best place to start is, mm-hmm. which seemingly was the most common question. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ro asked it and a couple other people on Twitter. Uh, how do you source stories? That's a really... Uh that's a really good question, and it's one that we're we're sort of working to answer sort of more uh, systematically. <laughs> um, so right now, um, stories have come like sort of like well, story like so part of it. Part of it's like we're not sourcing stories; we're sourcing podcasts. Uh-huh. So so on one level, the 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 people who are sourcing story stories are the actual teams themselves. So like the yeah. nod, one of our podcasts, it has a whole editorial process around finding stories that they're going to do. And startup has a whole editorial process and reply. All has a whole editorial process. So that's a team by team. And those teams know sort of like what their shows are about and what their audiences are into. So they have a process by mm-hmm. doing that. Um, and it's sort of the normal process of just sort of like, reading widely, talking to people on the phone, going out, hearing stories at cocktail parties, whatever it is, you know, and it's sort of like uh, finding something in the news that piques your interest in making some phone calls. Like that's always, that's that's the way stories are sort of like, there's no magic formula to it. You just, you sort of try to be curious to the world. So then thinking about sourcing podcasts, are people yeah. pitching you? So sourcing podcasts is a very different thing yeah. because you need, it needs to be sort of like, it's like, um, it's not the actual plot line. It's the it's the sort of like I, I remember this uh, somebody I, I for a while like somebody at, at This American Life was was friends with one of the people who started Friends, the TV show Friends, oh, yeah. and um and Alexa was her name, and she was like she was like she was on the show a couple of times. She did a couple episodes, and and um I remember I think somebody was telling me a secondhand story about like how she talked about like sort of coming up with the idea for Friends, and she was like starting a TV show is like it. You want it to be just specific enough so that there's something that you can remember about it, but then also very, very open. Mm-hmm. And basically, you always need a couch, <laughs> 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 sort of like where action can happen, okay. you know. And uh, and so I feel like a, uh, like sourcing a podcast is sort of this, is similar to that. You need okay. like what's it? It needs to be about something, but it can't be the concept can't be too binding. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to find enough stories to sort of keep it going. Yeah. Now, sometimes it can be sort of a limited series, and we do a couple of those, and we're and like we're we go back and forth on sort of like what the model is for that, and can they, you know, can they be profitable or not? Um, so some of it goes back to economics, but if like the basic unit is this is the regularly occurring sort of weekly or almost weekly podcast, like mm-hmm. let's say that's the basic sort of like template of podcasting. Um, those come to us a couple of different ways. Uh, sometimes people inside the company have ideas and we'll sort of do a piloting process to try to see if we can sort of make it, we'll make it and see how it sounds. People pitch us from the outside. Sometimes we will acquire shows that already exist out in the world. Um, and we've done done that and we've done it a bunch of different ways. Um, yeah. yeah, cause it's sort of, it's not all that different from, you know, someone interested in doing a startup sizing a market. And so mm-hmm. when someone pitches you an idea, are you like, hmm, intuitively this feels like it has legs or do you do any kind of like analytical process around the picking a show? We don't do any kind of analytical process around it. And, and, and partly because it's not like, it's, it's like we don't, right now the, 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 the sort of like the main, the capital that we need to start a show is, is human capital. Uh-huh. Right, we need somebody who who has a vision, has expertise, uh, and um, and can sort of make it make it happen. So we need somebody who can sort of like take it and run. And so a lot of times, what we're looking for is somebody who 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 has a vision. Okay, like that's that's it's like sort of like the 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 startup equivalent is sort of you bet on the founder. Um, I think that's even more the case in podcasting if 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 that's possible. Just like because. And that was one of the mistakes I made early on is sort of like, I had a background in doing this. I'd worked on This American Life. I'd helped start Planet Money with Adam Davidson. Like, I had, like, this experience doing this. And so I sort of just thought that, like, okay, I can I can sort of help start all these other ones. But I don't have enough time or bandwidth to sort of, like, be involved with in more than one or two. And if the company's growing, I don't have any bandwidth to do that anyway. So So we need people sort of like showrunner types or sort of like hosts who can sort of like 
lead the vision. And so that's that's a complicated set of qualities. You need they need skill, they need sort of like they need a vision, they need leadership ability. You know, there's like it's 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 tricky. So we're looking for people like that. And what do you look for in an acquisition aside from content and you know kind of founders, hosts that you believe in? Are there particular numbers that you look for when you're gonna you're gonna make an acquisition of some yeah. content? Yeah, I mean, we're looking for somebody who could who could be a good f- fit. Yeah, obviously, yeah. we're looking for um, somebody who who pops. So, like Wendy um, Zuckerman is a good example. Like that was a that was a show that we acquired. She had the, her show is called Sci- Science Versus. Okay, and that was something that she was doing out of Australia, um, and we heard it. And what it so she had a pretty good audience on her own, like that she'd sort of built yeah. more or less independently with just her and her producer, Caitlin. Can you talk about that specifically, like roughly what that was? Yeah. So we heard it. We really like, she was just like clearly like, just like a magnetic yeah. host, right? Like she's <laughs> yeah. just like, she's so funny, so smart, just so, so engaging. Um, and the premise seemed really good. We talked to her about like sort of like what her audience was like, and it was pretty. It was pretty solid, especially given that she'd been doing it all by herself. Is that like a hundred thousand downloads? Is that ten thousand downloads? Is that a million downloads? Uh, it's, it's not a million. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I think if you're if you're if you've gotten over if you've gotten up to a hundred thousand independently, yeah, you're doing really well. You're big time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so it was like, and so we're looking for some, like if you're, if you're, but if you're getting, if you're somewhere in that, you know, sort of getting close to that number okay. uh, independently, that's, that's, that's a pretty good sign. Okay. Um, and then it's just a matter of like, sort of like how much can we help? Mm. How much can we expose? How many more people can we expose you to? How much, you know, sort of like how, how much can we help with marketing and stuff? Um, so with Wendy, it was, it worked, it worked really well. We were able yeah. to sort of like take our audience and sort of multiple it you know several times over um and surround her with the team to make it possible for her to get more work out at a, at a quality that she was that she was striving for but you know just like by herself was really really hard to like get hmm. to you know she didn't have the luxury of sort of like auditioning sort of different experts on a topic <laughs> and finding the best one you know what i mean she had to go with the expert that she got and sometimes they were just dry as dust and so like yeah. you know, that shows in the in the product so if she can sort of cycle through a couple experts until she finds the one who's like more engaging to talk to that's a that's a win it's so, such a huge advantage because yeah. i i previously before yc was doing a podcast on my own with my friend and you know we we were fortunate in that you know like we knew someone at mailchimp right so they would help out and that's great but it really becomes a grind when you're doing it on your own. So observing you guys from afar, I was like, oh my God, this is such a perfect opportunity to start acquiring content. Yeah. Because as a sole creator, you have like no support behind you. Well, and that's exact. So that, so our latest acquisition is the pitch, which yeah. I'm, I'm sure your listeners are familiar with. And, and that's a, that's a perfect example of that. Like Josh Muccio, you know, started this podcast sort of like by himself out of his, him and his <laughs> so wife great. sort of working yeah. from his house in Florida. And he, and he's exactly sort of like, he's got this drive. He's got a vision for what he's trying to do. He's like been tweaking. He's been learning. Yeah. He's like sort of like learned all he can on his own. He's read every single thing that's ever been put up on Transom, you know, the sort of like radio <laughs> website. And, um, and he was just ready, you know, to sort of like, have you know take it further and like sort of go to the next next level with with his show and so that's it, it was just like it seemed like a very obvious sort of fit and what about the new people what about someone who's you know maybe just graduating college and wants to work at gimlet like what are the qualities you look for in them to be like oh man you might be you might have a fit here uh we're looking for so we're looking for um a, a couple of things we're looking for sort of creativity obviously um we're looking for like the ability to get shit done um uh, do you do a trial we we i mean we have a like an application process a lot of times with a lot of the jobs that we do we'll have like some sort of like a a, 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 like a sort of a homework assignment that we'll give people okay. sort of like a trial you know sort of like edit this interview or sort of like you know sort of like give us you know sort of like critique this story something mm. like that just to sort of get a sense of how they think editorially Curiosity is really important. Sense of humor, you know. We just we um, and and empathy is like a big hmm. big part of, of of what we believe is important. Like mm-hmm. you, you have to you you have to be motivated by a desire to to understand, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, as much as a desire as any other desire. Like sometimes, like a lot of people get into sort of like this line of work for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's like 
they really want to like they feel passionately about an issue and they want to sort of bring attention to that issue yeah. and all that is is true but I, but we want like we want it to be you know so it proceed from curiosity and understanding and are you guys kind of agnostic to what issue that is because historically i always thought npr and then you know all the npr diaspora like people working on their own content had a certain type of generally like left leaning audience that like right. fit into brooklyn or, or wherever yeah um do you guys care for like you know it's completely different than that I, we don't I, I so this is i mean i think honestly this is a, a sort of a a a complicated issue now for media companies that i'm that i'm trying to grap, grapple with like i feel like at, at npr we we were perceived as being liberal we and a pro, and probably like the the majority of the people working there mm-hmm. would sort of like call themselves liberal um but we really did strive for um objectivity or at least trying to understand both sides of the issue we would never just sort of like yeah you know um and and i think the listenership wasn't as like i think it was pretty even it was it wasn't like it wasn't down the middle yeah but there was like there was a, something like 30 to 40 percent of the listeners were identified as conservative hmm. and it was it was a pretty big you should surprising. check that number yeah. but it's it yeah. was it's a it's, it, when people hear it it's a surprising number yeah. to them huh. um and certainly the feedback I get, like, you know, sort of like for the first season of Startup, you know, it was like it seemed like pretty, you know, sort of like evangelical pastors and sort of like Brooklyn hipsters and everybody in between um, were listening to, the, to to Startup. And I think, you know, and we'll still like occasionally like on Reply All, there was like um, they they had a they they had something that sort of like let listeners understand that how one of them felt about Trump, <laughs> yeah. you know, and we received a couple of letters saying like, I'm, I voted for Trump. Like I, I love the show. Why are you, you know, sort of like, why are you saying that? So it's like, yeah. it's not, I don't think, um, so I don't, I don't. And, and honestly, like, I, I like that. Like, I feel like I understand there's like, I, under, it's tricky. There's like a lot of fear and anger. Um, and especially among communities like that are not white, right? Like, mm-hmm. especially like, um, and I think, and so I, and I want to give voice to that. You know what I mean? I think there, I think we do live in a racist society, like, and there is white supremacy and like that is real and yeah. it's not a political statement. It's a, it's a fact and it's based on historical, um, you know, things that happened, you know, (laughs) and 400 years of slavery and a, and a civil war that we never dealt with. And like, you know, and, um, and so like that is all, that's not political in my mind to say that. Um, so, but, but people perceive it politically. And so, and so when you, and so when you, so one of our shows is, you know, a show about the civil war Mm -hmm. and I'm shocked by how, uh, when I listen to it by how fresh and unusual it sounds hmm. and it sounds fresh and unusual. We just did the most recent episode was called the takedown and it was sort of like, it was, it was a live show that they, that they put on at the bell house. It was crazy. Like it, it was, um, it featured the Nicole Hannah Jones who just won a MacArthur grant, Al Letson, who's like a prominent uh, podcast host and Christy Coleman, the CEO of the, um, of the, um, the CEO of the American Civil War Museum, and then the host Chandra Kumanyika and and the and his other host Jack Hitt. And what was, and it was like a, it was sort of like they were talking about the 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 sort of the, the most pervasive myths about the Civil War that they constantly encounter on Twitter. Hmm. And what was, f- and the shocking thing that felt so fresh and new about it was that four of the five people on the stage were black, and like that almost never happens you know in a in a, in in conversations about the civil war mm-hmm. which was about slavery right. you know and so and so like and by the way that's one of the myths that it wasn't about slavery it was it was about slavery and and so and so and 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 like that's sort of crazy that yeah. like that like you have so much conversation about the civil war and how often black voices are not represented in that conversation yeah um when black people in america were at the center of the of the conflict and 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 the legacy of america results Mm -hmm. from the civil war and so and so that 
And I, I know that, and I know people listen to that, and like we, you know, every once in a while we'll get a comment like that feels political to people, and and I guess it, I guess it is, but I, but I, but it just feels like true. Right. Like it just feels like this is crazy that yeah. like it's 2017 and this feels new that we have like <laughs> Facts. four of the five intellectuals on stage talking about the Civil War are black, and that feels new and revelatory. Um. So, yeah. So I. So I. So. And I think. I have a media company now yeah. and there are a lot of voices that don't get represented in media and it feels like, yeah, I want to use that platform to help represent those voices. Right. Because I've kind of been wondering how, how you're driven, you know, um, obviously there are podcasts like that one, maybe like, like Dan Carlin, mm -hmm. uh, hardcore history that are super educational right. and where you guys are kind of drawing the line in terms of like, this is our mission. We're educating about certain issues or it's just about compelling storytelling mm -hmm. or maybe it's something else entirely. Like, do you guys have a defined goal as to what your products are and what they do? Right. I don't, so we don't like, I would never want to say that like, I mean, we take engagement very seriously. So anything yeah. that is like, it was really informative, but it wasn't very fun to listen to. Like that's, that's a lose, right? Like you definitely want to be, I don't want people to feel like they should listen to it, but they don't want to yeah. want to be like the, you know, uh, the Thomas Piketty of podcasts. And now I'll yeah. read Wikipedia. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, so, but, but I feel like the, but I feel like, um, here's the, the way I think about it is sort of like, there's like, I, I think there's three big buckets of why people listen to podcasts. Okay. Um, so, one of them is to just be one of them is because they they is for companionship like they like the hosts and like it's fun to hang out with them and like there's a whole bunch of podcasts that are that are like that like um joe rogan i think is a is a, is a great example like right like just people howard stern um but oh like rush that you know of sort stuff, of like Glenn yeah. there's like you feel like oh they're your buddy you know we're t we're we all speak we're all we're all talking together and it's yeah. fun to hang out with you and you guys are funny and like and even like the slate gab fest a lot of those are sort of like there's there's this sort of I, these are friends that I, they, they feel like friends, the hosts. So that's one. Uh, second, I think they just want to be told a, 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 go, a good gripping story. Mm -hmm. like we've been telling stories to each other since we came up with the ability to speak. Uh, and like podcasting is just a sort of an extension of that. And yeah. so like, I feel like you get Dirty John, a lot of the, a lot of the big, a lot you know, of your sort stuff. of like a lot yeah. of our stuff, a lot of like the sort of like um, S Town, you know, it was yeah. just sort of like, like just narrative, like the bulk of it is just narrative. Um, and then the third big bucket is like, they want to learn something. So a lot of, so podcasting is one of the things that you can do while you're not doing something else. You don't need to be at a screen. Um, so you're cleaning the house or working out or, you know, sort of like, um, you know, driving to work or whatever. And it's, it, you feel like, oh, I'm multitasking now in a way that <laughs> feels productive. And so I get to learn something. And so like, you know, like a big example. And so, so learning, I think is a big use case for podcasting. So we just try to figure out like, okay, what are we doing? And right now we've, we, and we try to do all of them. Like the, the big ones can sort of bring storytelling, bring that companionship and bring something that you learn. And those feel like, you know, and I, and I feel like, um, reply all, reply all often does that. They definitely have the companionship and they definitely have the storytelling down. A lot of times you're learning something along the way as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think so. A lot of our podcasts are doing are trying to trying to do do all three, and might focus more on one or the other. Interesting. So, a lot of our listeners are also founders and are also thinking about spaces as both just like interesting, but markets where they could potentially build something. So maybe it does make a little bit of sense to talk about the podcast industry more specifically yeah. than just the content stuff. Mm -hmm. You guys started three years ago. Mm -hmm. How has it changed since you started and where do you see it going given like the uh, current proliferation of like audio stuff in your home, AirPods, all that kind of stuff? Right. I, so it's, I mean, it's changed quite a bit. Like I think, I think it has changed much more quickly than I, than I thought. Like okay. I was in this for a long time, you know, like starting, <laughs> like I remember when we first put our first put out this American life as a podcast and there was yeah. like, I think, I don't know, 5,000 people listen to it or something like that, you know? Uh, and then, you know, sort of like I was doing Planet Money for like five years before leaving. And, and, and so, and just sort of like, it was like sort of ch changing and evolving and growing, but not at the clip. And then sort of like, then we started and Serial came along and then boom, man, everything mm -hmm. just like sort of, I think, I think 
in large part because of cereal, in large part because of us, I think. Um, and then just sort of timing, like all the ones who were already there were sort of like started picking up and, and it just became um, just a lot more, a lot more mainstream awareness, a lot more advertising dollars flowing into yeah. it um, and a lot more content creators coming on board. Um, so that's great. I mean, overall, that's that's fantastic. I think the ecosystem is is growing. Um, it changes things a little bit, like in terms of sort of like uh, you've got to bring your A game when it comes to sort of like content, but also sort of like have a have a much more robust marketing strategy mm -hmm. when you you know it becomes a little bit more sort of like a, a traditional media company where you gotta you gotta figure out like how you, what's your marketing plan, who are your con who are who are your partners, and you know sort of rolling it out that sort of thing. Um. um and then I think the, I think, uh, people are paying more attention to it. Like the platforms are paying a lot more attention to it now. So like Spotify tune in and, and of course, Apple, Apple was the dominant, just sort of like by, by accident, they created the category, you know, thank you very much <laughs> Apple and, uh, sort of created this whole ec ecosystem, yeah. but like the ecosystem, even though it was getting larger by our standards, by Apple standards was still like a tiny, you know, sort of rounding error. Totally. Um, and now it's gotten beyond rounding error status. And so they're starting to pay attention as well, um, which is all, you know, so like I think now there are, the platforms are like starting to starting to sort of like compete a little bit. And you see, you know, sort of you see like sort of like deals around content happening and yep. that sort of thing. So so that's 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 also really exciting because distribution is so difficult still. I mean, it's been mm -hmm. hard, but now it's like both hard to discover and competitive. Yeah. And so what do you guys do when you have a brand new show and you're like, we need to start this out with, I don't know, like whatever your benchmark is for like a good mm -hmm. amount of listeners in the beginning. Mm -hmm. How do you make that happen? Yeah. I mean, that's changed a little bit. Like yeah. we, we, it used to be, um, that we didn't have to do as much, you know, I yeah. think the landscape has gotten more crowded. I think also tr like politics has become a much bigger storyline and you've got shows coming out like Pod Save America and the daily that have brought a lot of new people into podcasting, mm -hmm. but like, it's like a, you know, they're, they're focused on sort of like the craziest story that's happening right now, which is, you know, <laughs> sort of like, you know, the presidency. Uh, and so, um, <clears throat> so that's, that's, that's been interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, but what we do is what we, you know, we have a nice network now of, of, you know, sort of of listeners and we have, a, you know, millions of unique, of unique listeners now that we can sort of put new shows in front of, um, that works. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also need to start finding other audiences, right? So like we have, you know, sort of millions of unique listeners, um, but then there's like lots of other people who sort of would listen, but don't know about podcasting or don't know. And so, and those people are like, sort of like they're, they are, there's like a, this continual drift, you know, right? The, the category is growing for sure. Um, but uh, that just takes more work and it's just sort of like a longer sort of like, it's like, you've got to give shows time basically. Like we've got to we sort of like, we, Part of it is like you got to get the editorial sort of like where as as cranking and so like shows I, almost every show that we ever launched has been sort of like a little editorially wobbly <laughs> in the beginning as it gets its feet. It's like but it's like it's just man. a crazy yeah it's, it's like just a, a crazy thing. It's like a, yeah. yeah exactly yeah, they're yeah. startups they're, they're yeah, own yeah. they're their own little startups so they come out they get they get solid they start producing sort of work at a consistent quality then they get written about maybe they become guests on other shows maybe they sort of like start doing partnerships with other publications you know just sort of like getting their name out into the into the um into the world maybe they they do like a, a joint production with some with a larger with a larger uh podcast out there there's all sorts of strategies like i mean the the best place to find podcast listeners is is on other podcasts that's 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 still true um we haven't figured out a great way of sort of migrating people from sort of like the realm of Facebook and Twitter into the realm of listening. Yeah. You know, it's tricky. Well, we can, uh, we do YouTube for that exact yeah. reason. Yeah. And it's been super effective. How does that work? So we tell me about how it works. Yeah, totally. So, um, like I said, the podcast I did previously, we were, um, we were always struggling with your same issue. Like how do people find it? And then how do people find the episode from like two years ago? Right. Which it, it sucks. It's still bad. Like mm -hmm. there are lots of things you can do around transcription, right. which is somewhat helpful. Mm -hmm. But if you Google anything, look where the videos show up in the ranking. Yeah. It's super high. Yeah. So like the actual way it works is 
uh, we record video when we do the podcast. Mm -hmm. I edit the video, which is mm -hmm. then exported to the podcast. Right. And then I title that like, you know, interview with Alex Bloomberg of Gimlet Media. Mm -hmm. And then I cut up the video into like five more videos that mm -hmm. have very specific titles. Mm -hmm. For instance, how to make a podcast, how to market your podcast, like how Gimlet works. Right. And those numbers will dwarf like the actual interview listen uh -huh. numbers. Right. Uh, our podcast numbers are still really high, but this like you don't have retention data. So uh -huh. I don't actually know because they're just subscribers. Right. So, you know, like you have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of subscribers, uh -huh. but how engaged are they? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so basically what we try and do is like use YouTube as marketing for the podcast right. and just own those like subscriber channels. And mm -hmm. it's been pretty good so far, mm -hmm. um, especially when you get a big name person. Right. With the little names, it's like still not the same, but yeah, yeah it's yeah. been super effective. So what, how much more, like how, how many more views do you have on the YouTube segments than you do on, than you do listeners on the podcast? So our podcasts do like 10 to a hundred thousand downloads per episode. Okay. And then the YouTube views will, depending on the person, uh, will be about the same, uh -huh. um, uh -huh. and which is amazing yeah. because I don't think they're the same people. Right. Um, and I think a lot of people are finding the podcast through that because those often get shared, whereas right. the podcasts don't get shared right. in the same way. Right. Yes. Podcasts sh sharing. It's, it's hard to share podcasts. It's so difficult. It's, it's really, it's very, very, you don't, you can't just like shoot it at work. And, and part of the problem, I think, so one of the, uh, to me, I think this is like one of the paradoxes, one of the many paradoxes of sort of building a media business based on audio. Um, the great thing about audio is that like it does exist in this sort of separate realm, right? Yeah. Like when you most of the time, like if, if I'm at my desk or I'm on my screen or I'm looking at something, I'm using my eyes um, to say, read an article. Mm -hmm. I'm like that article is competing for my eyes attention with a gazillion other things. It's competing with Facebook and Twitter and movies and like all every single you know, sort of like name on the planet who's launching their prestige television series and like every, you know, sort of like everything out there um, is competing with for my eyes. Then you've got like audio, which is over here. You're not going to you're not going to necessarily listen to audio while you're streaming, while you're like sort of on your phone looking through Twitter yeah. or whatever. You're going to listen to audio while you're mowing the lawn where you can't be doing those other things. So it's it's separate and like in a nice way, you know, you're driving to work, whatever. You can't be looking at a screen. So all audio is competing with is other audio or music, basically. Yeah. You know, right? Um, so that's great for us. Like, it, it feels like much more, like, we don't have nearly the menace that every, if I was launching sort of like a digital media company right now, just sort of like like trying to write articles or video or whatever, yeah, the, yeah. the landscape is so crowded. So it's good. The bad part of that is that, like, you don't, like, in this world, when you're driving to work, like, you're not going to just be like, oh, that's funny, I'm going to put it on my Facebook. You, there's not, like... There's not the mechanism even to share yeah. if you wanted to. It's consumed in a different way, so it's harder to even figure out. Like you get lost in it and you're not like the the distractiveness of like sort of like eye based media, <laughs> you know, <laughs> is that like is its advantage when it comes to sharing because totally. you're always like sort of checking something out. You're always doing two things at once. And so it's easy to just sort of like be watching something and then pop it over into your Facebook feed and, and share it like instantaneously. And the sharing doesn't even, yeah. the sharing doesn't capture the magic. It's like if you were to tell me a joke and then I were to write one line down and then share mm -hmm. it, it's like, Usually that's only used against you. Yeah. Like you see your comedians complain yeah, yeah, about yeah. this all the time. It's yeah, like, that yeah. was out of context. Yes. And similarly with podcasts, like, yeah, yeah you know, have, have this great conversation and one part is particularly funny only if you know the background. Yeah. And, and so, if you've had all the build up to it and everything like that and like the moment by itself won't work unless you've had all the, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, that's the, that's the problem with, with, with narrative. So, so on the one hand, it's our advantage. And I feel like it, it's like sort of allows us to build this business. You're sort of pioneers in this space. On the other hand, like, how do we get people into the space? How do we get other people who are already in the space to know about us? Like, that's, that's still a challenge that we're trying to figure out. Where do you guys fall now on, cause in season one of startup, you were talking a lot about technology, maybe mm -hmm. building technology. Yeah. How has your thinking changed in the past couple of years around that? So, well, we, I think early on we made the decision that sort of like to focus on our strengths. And if you look around here, we've got like, you know, we've got 80 some people here, you know, the vast majority of those people are editorial yeah. based. Like they're making podcasts, either random podcasts for Gimlet Creative or editorial podcasts for Gimlet Media. Um, and w up until like a couple, uh, up until about a month ago, we didn't have one 
technology person on the team. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, so we were very old school. Yeah. Um, at this point, we we have recently <laughs> uh, hired somebody ahead of product, and okay. we recently um, and we're and and I think that's going to be that will definitely be a, a larger part of what we do. Yeah. Um, wh- how exactly we use technology is 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 still is still TBD. Yeah. Um, it do, it seems less likely that if we were ever going to build like our own platform, that seems less and less likely. Like just because you know the Spotify's and the TuneIn's and the Apples are definitely like for a while like they weren't really paying attention. Now they're definitely paying attention, and so it just seems like that's to take that space now. Just seems like you it's like a big long shot, and we're not at all set up to to even try to do that right well especially if it's you because like individual podcast hosts are incentivized for downloads Mm -hmm. so they actually don't want to be captured by platforms Mm -hmm. and so i if i'm a host i'm like i don't care where i put it this is not obvious to people who uh download podcasts from itunes but it doesn't work the same way as a song it's an rss feed yeah and so it's just you can point it at anything and have it go out there yeah and i think the only people right now are just doing maybe like paid apps so like i think mark maron still does this right he has Uh a maron app so you get the 50 most recent episodes and you can get the old ones right maybe that's good for individual creators but for you guys yeah i don't know no we would we would want to be and i think there is there is a we we would like to go direct to listener somehow and yeah. like sort of like just because like that's you know like we want to deepen our relationship with the listener and like we want to and then and i think there might be other sort of revenue opportunities associated with like a direct a more direct connection with the listener um but uh but how exactly do we do that what's the mechanism um it will involve technology what that how technology will look like we're still not sure of so one question uh that came from twitter i want to get their name right yeah. is um oh swing ventures asks are you concerned about how the podcast landscape may change when more analytics become available for example chart beats impact on journalism i mean i'm concerned about everything <laughs> probably a lot of stuff <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh and that is one of them i don't i don't yeah. you know uh it's you know, like everything, there's a, there's a good side and a bad side, right? Like, so, so like right now there's a lot of advertisers who would be interested in advertising and podcasting who are sitting on the sidelines because you just can't provide the same kind of analytics that you can in other forms of digital media. So they're just like, well, until we know what we're getting with our money, we're not gonna, Mm -hmm. we're not gonna spend here. Um, and so analytics will absolutely help the overall sort of like advertising landscape, which, more advertisers being interested in the space should theoretically yeah. help us. Like, yeah. you know, that will, more demand for the inventory should mean a higher price for the inventory. Even if we discover that like, um, that like, you know, there's certain listen through rates are, are different than what we expected or whatever. Right. I don't think we're going to be that surprised. Like we have access to some of that information already through some of these other platforms. Like, mm-hmm. you know, some of the other platforms let you sort of see like mm-hmm. what the decay rates are, that sort of thing. So, so we, we, we can see na- analytics are getting better, yeah. a lot better. Yeah. Um, so we, we sort of know. And then a lot of the, uh, and, and then for a lot of the, the advertisers, especially the direct response advertisers, like the Squarespaces and the, and the, um, and the Caspers and, and people like that, like where it's sort of like, it is, very sort of like it's not like oh this sort of like murky sort of like proposition where like we're going to advertise here and hopefully people feel better about us it's a very much like a like a people sign up for squarespace it's a formula (laughs) yeah Yeah. and if they 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 know like here's how much we spend here's how many like customers we get here's lifetime value of those customers it is worth it for us to, to to advertise at these rates or not right and and so so that's also a pretty good market test like People are advertising at the rates that we're charging and they continue to sign up. Yeah. Uh, and so, so that means that it's working. Do you have strong opinions on what type of content is going to, is, will be doing well in the future? Um, like I, the landscape has seemed to have shifted a little bit. I mean, it's probably just broadening. So there's room for everything. Yeah. Um, but are you seeing trends in like certain types of content, whether it's like, uh, subject matter, length, uh, type of host, uh, style of host mm-hmm. that's just like coming out of nowhere and really dominating. Yeah. I mean, well, clearly like 
crime and true crime. People <laughs> exactly. love crime. Yeah, it's yeah. like, and I think that was like sort of like serial inadvertently sort of like cracked that open and and it, and it's just been sort of like it's been hmm. nonstop ever since so like after serial and that was like i don't think that was i know obviously i'm very close with all the people who worked on the serial team and and that was a, that was a story that they were interested in personally but they don't have I don't, they're not like interested in true crime as a genre yeah um so it was like largely an accidental i think but but um uh so, but that like ever since serial, there's been like tons That's and tons surprise. of true crime, and like yeah. they've all they've all done very well. <laughs> um, and it's seemingly sort of like sort of like across the spectrum of sort of like produced, non-produced, sort of like you know, there's some that are like talk shows just sort of discussing sort of like what they find online. There's some that are sort of like following a single case throughout twists and turns. And there's some all in the middle, and like they all they all do pretty well. Um, you know, we launched, a, you know, sort of a crime related show, Crime Town, which is sort of like about crime and, 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 and politics and sort of the interplay between the two. Um, and that did really well for us. You know, I think there's a lot of mobsters and gangsters and, you know, it was, it's, you know, it's interesting, you know. What about stuff like, like lore? I saw that they have an, I think it's an Amazon show yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Is that, that transition to video interesting to you guys? Oh yeah, absolutely. We're doing that. I mean, we're, there we are a couple a, questions a about of, it. We have a bunch. We have a bunch of projects in the works, um, sort of translating stuff that first appeared in audio into video. Um, most notably, I guess, is the ABC sitcom <laughs> uh, <laughs> Alex Inc., um, uh, which is going to come out, I guess, this this winter, um, which is based on season one of Startup, mm -hmm. and sort of like the Alex character is played by Zach Braff. Um, uh, there's, um, you know, our fiction podcasts, our first fiction podcast homecoming, mm -hmm. uh, is going to be made into, we got a two season deal with Amazon. Um, that's going to launch sometime in 2018. Uh, and that's exciting. That's starring Julia Roberts in the, in the lead role. <laughs> uh, so life is weird. That's bizarre. <laughs> uh, what, what about this? Yeah. What about the stuff you had to kill? Or, or you just decided to kill along the way? Like, how are you making those choices? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is sort of like, it's like, it all comes down to sustainability. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and that can mean a couple of different things. Like, sometimes there's like, sometimes the, the concept is like just too complicated to pull off at the, at the frequency we need to, need to pull it off. Um, uh, and it's hard. Like I come from this background of like sort of like when we were first pitching this, I was talking about like sort of like how how we were going to be distinguished. Like you know, several years ago, when I was pitching investors. How are we going to distinguish our our material from like podcasts out there? And I was just sort of like, oh, ours is going to be produced, and we're going to like sort of like you know, so we're going to like hire teams, and we take this very seriously, the craft of it. And one of our investors, I remember saying, so it's he's like, so it sounds like you're just saying you're going to do. Whatever else does, but just it's going to be a lot more expensive to produce. And I was like, yeah, I sort of am saying that. Uh, and 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 the hope is, which has been somewhat borne out by by the facts, yeah. largely borne out by the facts, is that like when you take the attention to detail, you crack through to a different realm of audience than 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 something that isn't that that isn't as highly produced. Yeah. Now there was lots of caveats. Number one being like you can have like a a, a talk show. Joe mm -hmm. Rogan is a perfect example where. It's just like it does monster numbers. It has monster engagement, and like and like, there's there's not. It doesn't take months to produce each episode. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so and it's great. You know what I mean? And it's like it's great. Like there there's there's great live. A lot of the great things about like <clears throat> that are showing up in in our episodes are showing up on you know in 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 his his podcast as well. And like there's some people who are just great live and like. That's sort of lightning in a bottle. Those people are, that is much harder than I have than so much think. respect for that. Yeah. Doing this video stuff is, is an absolute education in holding conversations with people. Because before when I did just an audio podcast, mm -hmm. editing is magic. And all of a sudden everyone's smarter and funnier yeah. and it's just like really zippy. Yeah. And now I've really had to learn about like how to control the energy in a room when you're having a conversation. Yeah. Because we edit this, but not nearly as much as we used to with yeah. audio. Yeah. So yeah. That's yeah. been really wild. So... So anyway, so, but that, so that we were making these sort of more expensive, but then like sometimes like the, like 
and and like a lot of times like you can have like this amazing sort of concept and it and it's like yeah it's thrilling and people everybody it becomes the thing that people discuss and people want to hear it um but like if we can't if it can't be sustainable if it can't come out a certain number of times a year then there's no way to there's no way to make it okay. make money um sometimes it's sort of like the is it are the t- is it is the team passionate about the the thing that they're doing? And if not, it doesn't make sense to continue. It's better to find something that the host is passionate about rather than try to sort of match the host with some sort of material that you think could work. And that was a, that was a lesson we learned early on. Interesting. Um, I think with with uh, you know with Sampler, for example, was a, was a show. We, it was like a podcast about podcasts, and the host was Brittany Luce, who we'd heard you know sort of hosting another show for colored nerds and we really she's she's great she's got this great energy on the mic and so we were just like hey Brittany come and host this thing and she was like yeah that's great but it's like and it was it, it did it, it was fine it was a it was a pretty good it was a pretty good podcast and she did a really good job and like we we liked it but it wasn't like her passion and like it was it was doing fine but it wasn't doing gangbusters and so we were like well let's just let's just have you host a show that you like care deeply about (laughs) (laughs) and let's see if we can do that. And so we sort of shut that down, restarted, we hired her other co-host Eric Eddings and we, and we launched the nod, which is sort of like a celebration of black culture. Their, their sort of tagline is blackness is biggest fans. And like that show is like, you know, that, that's that. And, and like the energy of that show and just sort of the, the, the feeling of it is just like, it's, it's really exciting. So like, they just, they just, feel it and they're like it's like it's got a lot of energy i think that's so critical like people underestimate how important it is to just come in really strong and have that vibe mm-hmm. because most podcast um listeners have picked their favorite shows in my experience because they just they engage with this person like you were saying before that mm-hmm. that first category there's mm-hmm. that like joe rogan type person mm-hmm. where folks just bond with them mm-hmm. and when that's done poorly it puts people off Mm -hmm. more often than not. When I talk about like, Hey, we do a podcast with YC, you know, we interview people that are interested in tech or kind of in that space. They're like, Oh, is it just a bunch of like dudes talking around mics, like goofing on each other? Right. And that's like, let's put a dent in the podcast world. It seems (laughs) like it's slowed it down quite a bit (laughs) because more often than not, that's how people were introduced to it. Yeah. That's how people think. That's what people think a podcast is. It's just sort of like a bunch of people sort of like, you know, pontificating around, uh, you know, mics, (laughs) you know, to each other and cracking jokes or whatever. And, and like, I think there's a lot of great, like a lot of people, there's a lot of podcasts like that, that have like very devoted fan bases that like that love that and like if you love the subject matter that like those that the people are wisecracking about then you're down for that like that's great and you yeah. you make a habit of listening to that podcast and and those those grow and do well um it's just like to cut through to get beyond like the the, the small group of people that are gonna be interested in whatever it is you're talking about you know just already yeah like you need to bring you need to bring some production to it to sort of like grow the audience beyond that so if I wanted to start a podcast today and I was a solo person, not affiliated with a big company, not within a podcast network, mm-hmm. what would you recommend I do to educate myself before I get started? Um, so I think, well, there's like a lot of online resources. Um, you did a course. I did a course on Creative Live, which was um, which was pretty much everything I know about making audio <laughs> combined into two days of listening and watching. Uh, which I think it's a it's it's definitely still available, and it's like you have to you have to buy it, but it's like yeah, you know, sometimes they run specials, and it's yeah, I I I say it's definitely worth it. Um, uh, there's like a bunch of free resources on uh, transom.org, which is like a, it's run by this great guy, Jay Allison, who's like a long time public radio sort of like mensch, basically. He's just been, a, he's, he's like, he, he's great. And he was like early on in my career, he was like really helpful. And he's just, he runs this in, invaluable thing hmm. called transom um, where he just gets everybody from across mostly public radio, but like, like, a lot of like the best sort of most exciting people inside the public radio world. So that strain of the podcasting universe, um, they just sort of lay out these manifestos where they just sort of talk about their, their tricks. They also have like field guide recorder reviews and sort of like, it's just like invaluable stuff like that. Um, there's, um, there's a guy, Pat Flynn, who does like the passive, I think, I think it's called the Passive Income Podcast. I've listened to that one. Yeah. 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 And um, he has a couple of YouTube t- tutorials, I think, that are just sort of like, here's how you set up your your system yeah. to do it. He's 
focused much more on sort of like the sort of daily here's how you know here's how the you technical do something aspect. Tech, yeah yeah um but that's but it, it's like he's they're they're good solid like you know sort of like tutorials um and then uh and then i think just doing it like to me the big the big thing is to find your find a friend who is who you trust and who's easily bored and just like do it get better at at like like just try just build stuff like whatever you want to do like yeah. whoever your hero is copy them and understand that you're going to be so much worse than whoever your hero is and you're also going to be different and you're going to be like, different you think you're copying them but you're not <laughs> but that's okay you'll get to the difference later just yeah. try to be as close as you can in the beginning yeah. and and i think that's like i mean ira glass gives us advice you know sort of who who is my mentor and sort of like um which is sort of like you have to start with some with a vision of what you want to be, and then like you copy that, and then eventually you'll find your way to your own voice through copying. Yeah. But like if you're just starting out, I'm <laughs> original. I'm going to do it my way. Yeah. Like it's really hard. I think there are people who can do that, and maybe you will be the TSLA of po po podcasting <laughs> and publish your masterpiece at 21, and like that's fine. But I don't think uh, I don't think that happens that often. Much more often, I think you just you 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 try to copy somebody who you admire. You suck at it. And along the way, you learn some things. You learn a lot because, you know, you talk to someone and so many things go unsaid because mm -hmm. either they're assumed or it's just style and it's like innate. Were there any things that um, kind of like non-obvious interviewing strategies that you picked up, whether it's here or at NPR? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think so. A big part is like um, I think I think interviewing what people respond to when you're interviewing somebody. So if you're doing the kind of podcasts that that we do yeah mostly the the fundamental building block of that kind of podcast is the interview and the fundamental building block of a good interview is two things one you want like people to tell you stories like there was this one thing that happened to me this one day i was at home i went outside blah blah blah. you want like a story it has a beginning it has a middle it has a punchline mm -hmm. that's building block number one if you have people who are telling you stories that's great the other fundamental building block is emotion is like emotional uh, honesty, mm -hmm. where people are talking in a real way about something, and some people are just good at that. In general, they they talk they talk they're emotionally present mm -hmm. when they talk, um, and those people are generally better interviews. Um, but then some people are like more guarded. Most people are more guarded, but occasionally you'll get to a moment of genuine emotional honesty. Mm -hmm. And it, I'm not talking about it has to be sad. Sometimes it can be happy. Sometimes it can be laughter. Sometimes it can be confusion, whatever, but something real, um, that you're, that you're, that's the other building block of an interview. And so, um, so I always say that like a good interview is like, is like a good therapy session where you're just trying to get people to put their feelings into words. And so a lot of times, if you're talking about something that has any kind of emotional stakes to it, there's, um, there's a moment where you're going to sort of like hear something in somebody's voice and you're going to want to press further and you're going to want to try to get to like, there's a, there's a funny feeling in the mm -hmm. thing that they said, and you're going to want to try to explore that funny feeling. And that's where the gold is. Mm -hmm. Um, so trying, training yourself to sort of be aware of that and sort of like getting people to talk about it without prying and without being confrontational but just sort of like getting them to open up about it and feel comfortable opening up so part the best thing you can do in an interview is listen like that's the number one thing um be yourself understanding that like you as the interviewer are part of the drama like mm -hmm. there's there, like a great question with a great answer is is riveting nobody will turn it off if you ask a great question like i remember there was this when i i sort of more sort of transform like a, a big turning point in my career was this uh, show i did for this american life me and adam davidson did it together it was called the giant pool of money mm -hmm. it was about the mortgage crisis and it was like an hour-long sort of explainer it came out in 2008 sort of like what's going on with the housing bubble and sort of all that stuff that's happened and we it was this big long thing we reported out for for months and months and months and there was it started with this question where this guy had we were talking to this guy at one uh, at a foreclosure sort of like event where he was like sort of talking about like this massive loan that the bank had given him. And 
he was saying like at the time he didn't have a full-time job. He had three not very steady part-time jobs. He was making a combined income of maybe $45,000 a year. And he got a, and he got a half million dollar loan from the bank without any paperwork. Basically, they didn't ask him any questions. And he was telling us about like how weird it was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then, and, and so he's talking about like, yeah, they didn't ask me any questions. They didn't like there was paperwork and stuff like that, but nobody asked how much money I made, how much money I had in the bank, anything like that, what my job was. And, and I asked him, I was like, would you have loaned you the money? And like, the minute you hear me ask that question, nobody is going to turn off Absolutely. the radio, right? Everyone wants to hear the answer. And like, and, and so, and he was like, no, I wouldn't have loaned <laughs> me the money. Nobody I know would have loaned me the money. I have guys that are criminals who wouldn't have lent me that money and they would break their kneecaps. <laughs> like, I remember like, you know, it was just sort of like that. And, and it was this great answer and it was sort of perfectly set up the whole question, which is sort of like, why did the banks yeah. loan people the money when they themselves wouldn't have loaned them the money, right? Like what's going on? So, but like that drama of the question and the answer is something that's very real. And if I had screwed up the question, if I'd just been nervous about it, or if I hadn't asked it right or yeah, whatever, yeah. if I hadn't been like present and just sort of like taking my job seriously and just asking the questions, um, I would have, you know, um, I would have, uh, it wouldn't have worked. So, um, so that's, that's the thing to also keep in mind is just sort of like you in, in audio more than anything, you are part of the, you are part of the show. Mm -hmm. And so just remember that. I think that's a yeah. great, great place yeah. to wrap it up. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thanks man. All right. Thank you.